Judges. Judges chapter number 16. I'll just tell you, the message tonight is not for you. Um, the message tonight that I'm preaching is not, it's not for you, it's for me. As much as I'd like to preach on something else, this is, this is for me. This is God's message to me tonight. And so, I'm hoping to get through this rather quickly so I can just pray. But Judges chapter number 16 tonight. Verse number one. Actually, I think it's going to deliver a little more context if we if we start in chapter fifteen and verse number sixteen, and we'll we'll actually read verse number one of chapter sixteen as the last verse tonight. It says, and Samson said, "With the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of an ass, have I slain a thousand men." And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand and called the place, good luck with that one, <laughs> Ramathihai. And he was a sore athirst and called on the Lord and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant, and now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. But God claved the hollow place that was in the jaw, and there came water thereout. When he had drunk, his spirit came again, and he revived. Wherefore, he called the name thereof, good luck with this one, in hak koro which is Lehi, that's better, unto this day. And he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there an harlot and went in unto her. As we get to this point in Scripture of Judges, Israel's finally free. They've been in bondage the majority of their time. Um, for all 80 years of Moses, for much longer before that. And yet, they've brought, God's brought them out. They've been brought out by two amazing leaders. Two leaders who are mightily used of God to lead God's people. You think of Moses, who for the first 80 years of his life really did nothing. Nothing of significance is ever said about him. Uh, for Moses, he spent 40 years wandering, 40 years training in the world of Egypt. And yet that first 80 years was to prepare him for his last years, leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. Egypt, you know, I often think about that, and I, I long for God to use my life. I long for God to use me. i got a long ways to go, Pastor. You've got a shorter time to go, but I've got a long ways to go before God can use me. <laughs> Moses is a mighty leader of God. And it's, it's through Moses that we see that the, the ten plagues wreak, uh, wreak havoc upon Egypt. It's through Moses that they walk past the Red Sea on dry ground. It's through Moses that they're given the Ten Commandments by which they are to live. It's through Moses that they would see uh, the bitter water turn sweet. It's through Moses that they would see uh, the water come out of the rock of Flint. It's through Moses that all these things, that, that he brings them to the brink of the promised land and shows them, and, and they're getting ready to enter in. And, and Moses says, I'm not going in. A new leader comes on the scene by the name of Joshua. And man, what a guy to replace Moses, but Joshua. I'm going to go ahead and say it. The only guy that could, have, that, that could have replaced Moses was a man named Joshua. And the people just got immediately behind him in, in the first chapter of Joshua when they say, look, we will follow you only if you follow the Lord. I love that the spirit of Israel in those days was not who's leading us. No, the spirit was who's leading our leaders, who's leading them. Because as long as God's at the head, then, then we're good. We're good. It's through Joshua that they see the walls of Jericho fall down flat. It's through Joshua that they're led into the promised land, conquest after conquest. It's through Joshua that they lived a, a life with intimacy with God. They, they lived a life uh, 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 longing before others. A life 
of integrity that Joshua had. And these, le- these two men, Moses and Joshua, they were great leaders of men because they were great followers of God. But Moses is dead. Joshua is dead. And there's no one that can take their place. It'll be 300 years until the first king is anointed, Saul. And Judges tells us what takes place during those 300 years. And the book of Judges is one sad book. Oh, there's some victory here and there. There's some conquest. There's some humor. Benjamin stabs a fat guy and his guts fall out. I've always found that to be funny. And he was left-handed, and I'm left-handed, and I always thought that was cool. Think of Gideon and his 300 men. Man, pastors with building programs can thank Gideon for that one, huh? Man. Best part is none of them gave money. Anyways. But sadly, the era of the judges is summed up by a perpetual backsliding. A cycle of the same thing happening over and over and over again. There's an abandonment from God. They choose to walk away from the God that was leading them. There's then an attempt... There's an attempt to, to, there's an attempt to, there's an an attempt that 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 they think they can beat God. Not only do they abandon him, but they think they're better than him. There's their attempt to be God. Of course, there is failure. Then there is asking for his deliverance, their admission of sin. Then there is an appointed judge. Then sadly, it is an abbreviated, an abbreviated, an abbreviated rest. And then they're abandoning God, attempting to be God having an attitude with God. Then there's asking for deliverance, repentance of sin. And then there's an appointed judge. A new leader is here. There's an abbreviated rest before it all happens again. You can sum it up in the last verse of Judges that says, in those days there was no king in Israel. And every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You know, that's called insanity. Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting the results to be different. And yet, that's what we find in the book of Judges is this constant insanity. Insane person after insane person after insane person. Just doing the same things, hoping for different results. Perhaps there's nobody that sums up this time period better than the judge, Samson. He's by far the most famous of all judges. Samson, known for his super, super natural strength. Samson. A simple understanding of him would tell you that his strength was in his hair. But a biblical understanding of him would say that his strength was in his Nazarite vow. A Nazarite vow consists of three things, one of them which was let no razor come upon their head. But actually the first two covenants that God sets with the Nazarites is that one, they should not uh, touch any dead thing. No dead animal. No dead meat. They couldn't couldn't eat any meat. They couldn't eat anything that had one time been living and had been dead. 
they were not allowed to drink wine. They were to be sober-minded constantly. And then they were to not let a razor touch their head. And so we have an understanding sometimes when we tell the story in church that Samson's strength was in his hair. But actually, Samson's strength was not in his hair. It was in his commitment to God. Look, the truth is, our strength is not found in our appearance. Our strength is found in our commitment to God. Our lives, when we are fi- our lives are filled with power when we keep our commitments to the Lord. And Judges chapter 16 reveals that while Samson was a man of supernatural strength, he was also a man of very natural weakness. Very natural weakness. And I fear that sometimes we have moments like this and we try to continue to keep them going. We try to keep the supernatural going without addressing the truth. There's a weakness. There's a weakness. The Bible says that your weakness is always going to be there as long as there is more compromise than commitment. As long as you are willing to negotiate with God, you will live in spiritual weakness. And it really doesn't matter how high the spirituals get. It doesn't matter how strong it may get. It will be temporary. And there's compromise. Proverbs 4, in verse number 23, you don't have to turn there, but it says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a forward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, and thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Uh, Solomon was telling his son, look, there's no room for compromise. Keep your eyes straight before you. Let your eyelids not shut upon the task at hand. Don't don't steer to the left. Don't steer to the right. Don't make a half degree turn because that's going to make a big difference in the end. Do not, do not, do not, do not compromise. This afternoon, God just, God just hit me hard. I'm telling you, man, I went home last night, and I was just living life, and I was just, this is great. I'm staying another night. I bought like seven tickets last night. I don't know how I'm going to pay for any of them, but, man, we're we're loving it. Finally, my my credit card got got declined, and Brother Ben had to put it on his card finally. We finally found a flight that was going to work and be doable, and I was pumped, and I was like, man, God, I can't believe you're extending the meeting. I can't believe we're adding another night. I can't believe all this. And I got to the room, and I sat down, and it was, God was like, well, you know why we're having another night, right? I said, yeah, because you're working, and it's great. He says, no, 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 because you haven't been listening. Whew, I got to tell you, tonight I ask myself the question, I guess I ask you the question, are you living a life that is that is?" that is marred by compromise or that established with commitment? Is your life one that is living by strength or by weakness? So I just want to notice three mindsets in the life of Samuel or the life of Samson that keep us spiritually weak. And I guess if I'm going to even make an attempt to apply it to you this evening is that don't let these mindsets, because look, I know, I know, I know, I know God has brought revival to you. God has dropped revival into our church this week, into your church. But I will stand up here with 
with complete honesty and say, it is not because of me. It's not because of me. The stories that, 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 that we hear in the prayer time and just the stories that have been talking to you, I, I mean, I, I smile and I think it's great, but I know, I know, I know, I know. It's not because of me. But I will admit to you this, you're here tonight because of me. You're here tonight because God is trying to work in my heart. Don't let these mindsets consume you as, as I've allowed them to consume me. First of all, I see Samson had a mindset of desires over duty. Desires over duty. The verses we read to start tonight's message is just one of the glimpses of victory that Samson had in his life. I mean, here he is, slain 10,000 with a jawbone of a donkey. I mean, you talk about an action movie. That's it. I mean, earlier he takes, he takes these, uh, what does he do? Are they cats? What, what were they? He takes foxes. That's right. He takes those foxes, and he ties them together, and he lights them on fire. And they run through the town burning the city up. That's cool, man. That's cool. But not only is it action, it's a love story too, right? He takes the gates, and he carries them up the mountain, and he lives in the gate. Wow. And as a judge, we read that Samson, in verse number 20 of, of the chapter, he, he was a judge in Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. And so God had anointed ju uh, uh, Samson to defeat the Philistines. He, he had appointed him to get rid of the Philistine enemy from Israel. And he, he starts out great with it. And here we see a great victory. I don't know about you, but we've had some great victory this week, have we not? Some great victory, but I'm telling you, who, as it's been true with me, sometimes our greatest moments of defeat are on the ends of victory. Look at verse number one of chapter number 16. Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there an harlot and went in unto her. You look at that and you just say, something's not right with this picture. He just came off a spiritual victory where, where God allowed him to, to slay his enemy, where, 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 where he cries out to God for a thirst and God fills him up. And the next day, he goes down to God's. I don't even know if it was the day. It says, then he went. I mean, it could have been the next, it could have been that night. He goes to Gaza, and he goes into the house of a harlot, and he went in unto her. He paid the fare. He did the deed. After a great moment of victory, Samson is in the worst possible place he could be. A place he had no business going. Something's wrong with the picture. And as you look at this, you say, Samson, couldn't you have taken some time to praise God? Couldn't, shouldn't you have taken some time to put your hands up and sing a song? Or shouldn't you put, put, put some words in your mouth of, of gratitude towards God working in your life? Shouldn't you have, have, have sought and asked him what, hit, what, what the next move should be in, in his conquest? Shouldn't you have asked for his direction? But no, 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 no. You didn't want to praise God. You wanted to play around. No, no, no. You, you, you didn't want to uh, pray to God to ask for direction. No, no, no. You wanted to pay for your desires. And all throughout Samson's life, we see him more concerned with his sexual desires than God's duty that he had put in his life. Maybe, 
maybe we should stop for a second and just ask ourselves, what are we concerned about? Are we concerned with what we want to do? Are we concerned with, with what we want to be? Are we concerned with what God wants us to be? Are, are we doing this for us? For our glory? Are we doing this for the tweet? For the Facebook post? Or are we doing this for God? What is our desire tonight? Because I'm telling you, God desires your desire to be his duty for your life. He desires you to desire and thirst after him. Not after yourself. Not after the lust of your flesh. Not after the pride of this life. Not after the lust of your eyes. No, God wants you to get alone with him. To be concerned about taking this message to the world. What are you concerned about tonight? You know, it's amazing. The Bible says that they that delight in the Lord, he gives them the desires of their heart. I always found that interesting. Because I think, well, my desires don't line up with his. Well, that's why you've got to delight yourself in the Lord first. You've got to get to where God, where you've, you've got to get to the point where, where, where nothing else makes you happy but God. And then guess what? You desire what he wants. Him. And he gives you it. Desires over duty. But notice, secondly, he had the mindset of flirting over fleeing. Flirting over fleeing. Verse number four, the Bible says that it came to pass afterwards that he loved a woman in the valley of Sork, whose name was Delilah. Delilah. <laughs> Seems like that's how you're supposed to say that word. Her name actually means uh, seduction. Her name actually means poison. flirtatious. In verse number five, I, I just find it so interesting. The Bible says, and the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said unto her, entice him. Entice him and see wherein his great strength lieth and by what means we may prevail against him that we might bind him to afflict him and we will give thee every one of us 1,100 pieces of silver. So this lady's about to get paid to do what she does. Entice him. Now, it could just be me, but I, I strongly believe the Philistines knew this was going to work. One, because they watched him go into that harlot's house that night. And two, the last time, the reason that he slain the 10,000 was because they murdered his wife. They said, this guy, his weakness is lust. We can get to him through lust. And so they said, your name's Delilah. Go be Delilah. Go be Delilah. And verses 6, 11, 13, and 15 is Delilah enticing Samson. Look at it in verse number um, Six. It says, Delilah said unto Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth. I know that's not a Delilah voice at all. I know that's not <laughs> pleasant to hear. But I can't I can't do Delilah. So I can do Goliath, but I'm not preaching about him. So this Delilah says to Samson, tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. And what I find so amazing about this is that, yeah, I mean, I guess that's playful, but she tells him what she's going to do. Tell me why you're so strong. Tell me, tell me where your strength lies. And tell me how I can bind you and afflict you. 
I want to torture you. How do I do that? I mean, I mean, what? What I find so interesting is that, that one, they don't know where his strength lies. And so sometimes I think we paint Samson as this is like, World's strongest man, just, I mean, I mean, we picture him to look a lot like me, honestly. I mean, just like, <laughs> just like, you know, muscles upon muscles, strength upon strength, you know, beauty upon beauty, that he was just, you know, you know, that he was just, uh, that he was just, you know, not me. And, and that's how we kind of view him, that he was just this really strong guy. But the Bible says that no man knew where his strength lieth. So maybe he did look like me. Maybe he did look puny. The point is, his strength was a mystery. They looked at him, they, they looked at Samson and said, How is he doing these things? It was unexplainable. And so Delilah comes to him and says, Where's your strength at? What's your workout regime? What program are you on? You do yoga in the morning? I mean, what, what's, what, what's the secret? And I love Samson. No, I don't love Samson. But I find myself as Samson. And he's not going to tell her. In fact, he's going to tell a lie. I love it. Samson said unto her, I don't love it. I don't know why I say that. But verse number seven, Samson said unto her, if they bind me with seven great withs, that have never been dried, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Well, this is complete baloney, okay? Complete baloney. So they do it, right? Verse number eight. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up uh, to her seven green whisks, which had, not, which had not been dried, and she bounced and she bound him with them. Now there were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber, and she said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he brake the whisk as a thread of tow is broken when he toucheth the fire, so his strength was not known. So she does exactly what he says is, 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 is what's keeping him from being strong. She binds him with these seven whisks that have never been dried. I mean, this sounds like some legend of a troll under a bridge that had to create these whisks, you know. And, and, and th they get these. They're like, this took, this, this took a lot to buy, so we better hope this works. They bind him up. And Delilah, in the middle of the night, I mean, she's got all the, all the Philistines are in there with her. And she goes, Samson, oh, the Philistines be upon me. Damsel in distress. And Samson, whoosh, whoosh, and he slays them all. His strength was not withstood. Now, I don't know, but I'd like to think, actually, I used to like to think that if I was Samson, the first time, fool me once. Fool me once, shame on me. Or no, shame on you. <laughs> fool me once, shame on you, Delilah. But fool me twice, shame on me. But look what she says. Delilah said unto Samson, Behold, thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Now tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou mayest be bound. What? And he said unto her, if they bind me fast with new ropes that never were occupied, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Okay, so now he's just kind of playing a game, right? Because he's telling her another thing that's completely fabricated. And you're thinking, okay, he's just going to have a little fun with her. He's like, maybe, maybe he's thinking, this is how I'm going to get rid of all the Philistines. I'm just going to keep telling her lies. <laughs> and they're all going to come in, and I'm just going to keep killing them. And so she comes in, and, and he knows it. Look, she is not hiding her agenda from him. He knows what she's doing. But he liked it. He liked the temptation. And he thought he was above the temptation. He thought he could just kind of toe that line a little bit. I'm not going to actually tell her where my strength is. I'm not going to actually tell. I'm not going to actually give up my, my strength. That, that, that's nonsense. 
And so what do they do? They bind him with the ropes, and sure enough, she says, Samson, the Philistines be upon thee. And whoosh, 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 action movie, soap opera, action movie, soap opera. I mean, it's the same thing over and over again. He beats them all up. And the Bible says in verse number 18 that Delilah said unto Samson, Hitherto thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Tell me wherewith thou mayest be bound. And he said unto her, watch this, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web. He's, he's getting a little closer to the truth there, isn't he? He's towing the line a little bit, isn't he? He says, oh, you just got you, you to braid my hair. And this is what's so stupid to me. He lays down in her lap, and she starts braiding his hair, and he falls asleep. I mean, at what point is Samson going to wake up from this stupidity and say, uh, this is not good? Samson looks at her and tells her. He gets a little bit closer, just a little bit closer, just a little bit closer. Oh, he knows what's going on. He wasn't blind to her agenda. Samson was just willing to see just how close he could get to the edge without falling in. And she fastened it with a pen in verse 14 and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awakened out of his sleep. And he went away with the pin of the beam and with the web. And she said unto him, How canst thou say I love thee when thine heart is not with me? How can you say you love me when you keep doing the exact same thing I tell you my strength is constricted by? That's not what he says, is it? Nope, she says, thou hast mocked me these three times and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words. The word pressed there just simply means to prick. She just kept on prodding and she urged him. It means she literally is pushing him. She wouldn't stop talking about it. She wants to stop talking about how much she loved him and he doesn't love me. And if you love him, love me, you tell me where your secret was. Is that, that was all he heard was just, nya, 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 Tell me where your great strength lies, Samson. Tell me where your great strength lies. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Fool me thrice, somebody call me a doctor. Fool me four times, fool me four times, and I'm just playing games. In a basketball game, there are boundaries, are there not? There are lines that if the ball touches, it's out. If a guy's dribbling with a basketball and he touches one of those lines, he's out of bounds. It's a violation. It's a turnover, as they call it. The other team gets the ball. That is part of the game of basketball. But did you know the goal? The goal of the game of basketball is not to see how close you can get to coming out of bounds and not coming out of bounds. The goal of the game of basketball is to get a basketball into a hoop. To score points. I've never turned on, never turned on a basketball game and watched someone dribble down the sideline, getting oh so close to the out of bounds line. And just like, ooh, look how close I am. But hey, I'm doing it. I'm still in bounds. Never seen it. Never seen it once. Man, football, you know we all love those sideline catches, don't we? Did he get both feet in? Did he get both feet in, right? We love it. We love it. But did you know that's not the point of the game of basketball or the game of football? It's definitely not the point of the game of basketball. 
That's not the point of the game. That's not the point of the game of football. The, the, the point of the game of football is not to catch that ball and just get barely enough. I mean, I mean, I've seen plays where the running back, I mean, is, is running down the sideline. He's kind of drifting out of bounds. I mean, they show the replay. I mean, you can barely see that little slither of green. And that's what they all say. It's like, man, how did he keep his balance to stay in bounds? I mean, it's so cool, but that's not the that's not the point of the game. The point of the game is to score a touchdown and win. To score more points than your opponent. And I've never turned on a game of football and just watched the strategy be, I'm going to throw it. I'm going to just continually throw it towards the sideline, and you just continually try to catch it with your toes, barely staying in bounds. No, no, no. That's not their goal. That's not their focus. Their focus is to score points. And I'm telling you, you can, you can, you can toe the line and not cross God's boundary. Did you know that? You can. You can live your life trying to decide what, what is breaking God's law and what is not breaking God's law. And, and you can try to, uh, uh, you know, come up with all your little appendix and your little own dictionary that tells you everything that, that is a law or isn't a law, and this is kind of close but not. And we spend the majority, the majority of our lives are spent by seeing how close we can tow that line. You started a Christian school. You know this is true. Dress code. How close can I get to not following the dress code? I went to college. Oh, I definitely know this. We focus so much on making sure we can just stay close enough in bounds, that we're just, we stay just enough far away from the line, we'll still be good. And we walk through life like this. Look, when our, when our eyes are constantly placed on the boundary rather than the basket, we lose. And you play with fire long enough and you're going to get burned, Samson. You're going to get burned, Eric. You're going to get burned, Astatula Baptist Church. And as long as we have our mind not put on the proper place, not put on the goal this evening, we will not have revival. And Samson is pressed and he's pressed and he's pressed and he's urged and he's urged. And finally, he told her all his heart. And he said, there hath not come a razor upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. You mark it down. There's no playing games there. He is trapped. He is enslaved to his sin. He got the ball, he intentionally traveled out of bounds, and sat down on the bench and said, I'm out of the game, coach. I'm out of the game, coach. I'm out of the game. Contrast Samson's temptation with Joseph's in Genesis 39. There he is in Potiphar's house. I mean, Samson's doing what he's supposed to do. Joseph has no clue what's going on. Why am I in Egypt? Why am I working for this guy? And yet Joseph was mighty in his work. He had his, his eyes fixed on what God wanted him to do. And the Bible says God was with him. But you know the story, Potiphar's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. I know sometimes we view this story as, well, Potiphar's wife was probably uglier than an ant, you know. <laughs> well, I think Potiphar's wife would have been very beautiful. The Bible says she cast her eyes on Joseph and said in verse number 7, lie with me. She made her intentions clear. And Joseph, I suppose, in that moment, could have thought to himself, I'd like to do that. No one will know. I'm in Egypt. My brothers told Dad I'm dead. No one's looking for me. I don't know what the story they, they sold him, but no one's looking for me. Do you know what Joseph says in verse number 8? The Bible just simply says, but he refused. But he refused. You know, Proverbs 1 and verse number 10 says, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. 
just say no. Just say no. Just say no. Verse number 10 says, day by day. She came to him day by day. She pressed him. She urged him day by day. Lie with me. Lie with me. Lie with me. And the Bible says that he said, how can I lie with thee and do this great wickedness against God? How can I do that wickedness against God? He says, yeah, my, my dad might not know about it. My mom might never find out. My brothers probably wouldn't even care. And I might get a kick out of it. But God sees it. I can't do this great wickedness in the sight of God. The Bible says that she caught him. She got him. She grabbed him. She hid in the closet. I don't know how, but, 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 but she got him. She got hold of him. And I love it. Jacob left his coat with her. Man. Uh, my dad used to say, it's better to lose a good coat than a good character. He said, I'm getting out of here. I don't know what he did. It probably was, it was self-defense, though, definitely. He left his garment. When it came to temptation, Samson chose to flirt. Joseph chose to flee. First Timothy 6 and verse number 11 says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, and charity. Second Timothy, verse number 2. Uh, Second Timothy in verse number 22 says this, Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord of a, out of a pure heart, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. Romans 13 and verse number 14 says, make no, or the Bible says, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Don't, don't toe the line. Don't make provision for the flesh. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He had the mindset of desires over duty. He had the mindset of flirting rather than fleeing. And then notice finally, he had the mindset of abilities over anointing. And this one hits home for me. Verse number... 18 says that when Deliah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he has shown me all his heart. And the lord of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand. And she made him sleep upon her knees. And he called for a man, and he caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. Watch it. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. Amen. Samson falls asleep on her lap. She shaves his head. He knew what was going to happen. And yet he wakes up, and the Bible says he's got just the same amount of confidence as he had all those other times. And he says, I, I will arise. I will shake myself just as I've done all the other times. And he wist not that the Holy Spirit was departed from him. He was trusting in his abilities to get by, not his anointing from God. He thought he, could, he, he thought he could cross the line and that it was all going to be okay because, man, he was blessed. 
He, he had natural talent. He was strong. After all, man, I, I had taken the jawbone of the ass and slain the thousand Philistines. I had tied the fox's tails together and burned the whole city. I had carried the gate up and shook fear into the Philistines. And if you'll do this, I'll be like any other man. No, Samson, you've always been any other man. You've always been just the same flesh and blood as this flesh and blood. You've never been anything special. The only thing special about you was that you had God's spirit upon your life. You had his anointing because of your commitment towards God and you've been towing that line and towing that line and towing that line and you've crossed that line and you think you're immortal you think you're something special no 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 they pluck out his eyes they beat him to scorn they set him up as a puppeteer to mock them they put him up as the trophy for their celebration where they're going to do wickedness inside in the sight of his face they put they put children as guards to watch over him. Oh, he's real weak now. Oh, he's real weak now. I think just sometimes I get up to preach. And I know, I know God's going to use it. I know he's going to use it. And guess what? God does use it. I think I've prayed multiple times this week. Lord, would you work in spite of me? You know why I say that? Because I knew he wasn't going to work through me. I knew he wasn't going to work through me. There was stuff going on in my heart. There was stuff going on in my mind. There's stuff that I've been holding on to, and I've been preaching about it every night. And maybe that's just why the Lord's worked this week, because, man, I'm preaching to myself. I'm preaching to myself. I'm preaching to myself. And God's been preaching to me. He's been preaching to me. He's been preaching to me. And you've been listening, but I haven't been listening. And finally, like this afternoon, as I'm broken in my sin, as I'm sitting there and I just cry out to God, Lord, break me over this. I don't want to trust in my ability. I don't want to trust in the assurance that it's just your word and that's going to do it. No, no, no. I want to be a vessel used and fit for the master's use. I don't want to be a dog dish. I don't want to be a dog dish. I want to be that fine glass that's brought out on special occasions and used by his master because he loves it, because he loves to drink from that cup. He loves to go back to that vessel. Oh, I cried out to God and I'm crying out to him right now. God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I've allowed my abilities to get in the way of your anointing that you desire to pour on my life. My friends, we want revival. It's not going to come from the stir of emotions. It's not going to come from, from, from the stir of our abilities to come down to an altar and pray. It's not going to come from our abilities to sing songs with our hands lifted high and say praise and praise and praise him. No, it's not going to come from the abilities. It's going to come from the anointing of God. It's going to come when God's spirit lifts the roof off this building and pours it out upon each and every single one of us. And I'm telling you, that anointing only comes, it only comes when we are committed to his word. When we are not just saying, but we are living, we are being, we are breathing. We are breathing God's word. So down on my knees in that hotel room this afternoon, I said, God, I need to, I need, I need to strengthen the boundaries. I said, God, would you help me establish a daily, a daily discipline to read your word? You say, that sounds really elementary, Eric. Yeah. That's what it took for this old preacher. I said, God, would, would you establish in me a daily discipline to lead my family in devotions? I said, Lord, because some of this stuff is apart because we're not, we're not seeking your face together. And she's trusting in my abilities, and, she, and I'm trusting in, in my abilities to lead this family. And God, it's not working. Pride goeth before a fall. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. The Bible says, ye that think, ye standeth. Take heed, lest ye fall. The gifts that God has given us. And he's given us gifts. But they, are be, they are to be used with God. In other words, the gifts that he's given us are not to be used for God. 
They're to be used with God. They're to be used with God. 